So welcome to this morning session of Eco-Socialism 2021. Why Eco-Socialism? The global fight for a red green future. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and hello to everybody in, in Australia. I'm speaking to you uh, from Canada and from Eastern Ontario. This is where I am is unceded traditional Algonquin territory of the Anishinaabe people. And I'm speaking with great respect for the indigenous people who have walked this land for so long. Many thanks to Socialist Alliance and Green Left for inviting me. Um, you've been a great host when I have been able to get physically to Australia, but it's good to talk to you digitally at this time. Over a century ago, the great Irish revolutionary James Connolly wrote a poem that I think is very relevant to today's meeting, today's subject. The poem was called, Be Moderate. And the opening verse went, some men faint hearted ever seek our program to retouch and will insist whene'er they speak that we demand too much. Tis passing strange, yet I declare such statements give me mirth for our demands most moderate are. We only want the earth. That's what we want. We only want the earth. We want to rest our planet from the hands of the vandals who are destroying it. We only want the earth. Nothing less will do. You know, today's student strikers and the Extinction Rebellion protests are big steps in the right direction. Those activists are building an independent radical counterforce in the streets and eco-socialists fully support them in that absolutely essential effort. Now it's very different of course with the liberal greens whose entire focus is on lobbying our masters to solve the crisis for us and who are afraid of alienating capitalist politicians and corporate executives. There's another verse in Connolly's poem that describes their approach. Be moderate, the timorous cry, who dread the tyrant's thunder. You ask too much, and people fly from you aghast in wonder. Typically, environmental liberals insist that the best way to stop climate change, if not the only way to stop it, is to put a price on carbon, usually by imposing some form of tax on fossil fuels. The theory says that emissions will decline if prices are nudged up. They rarely address the fact that although oil prices have risen radically in the past 50 years or so, production and emissions have risen at the same time. Rather than switch to alternative sources of energy when oil got expensive, the oil industry went after unconventional oil, fracking and mining tar sands. Despite that, many sincere greens believe we can fix the world just by nudging the market a little bit. Unfortunately for such wishful thinking, what humanity now faces is not a single solvable problem that can be dealt with by a minor tax change but a convergence of ecological crises that actually threatens the survival of civilization. Now, climate change is of course the most extreme and immediate aspect of the emergency, but we also face superstorms, rising sea levels, massive wildfires, toxic air and smog, ocean acidification and dead zones, species extinction, soil erosion, freshwater depletion, ozone destruction, indestructible plastics and chemical pollution, deforestation, expanding deserts, antibiotic resistant bacteria and new diseases and plagues. And the list goes on and on. This is a planetary emergency. What we confront are not individual problems that modest reforms and policy shifts can fix, but a complex and interlocked set of disruptions of the natural processes that have made Earth habitable for thousands of years. 
12 years ago in 2009, a team of 28 internationally renowned scientists convened by the Stockholm Resilience Center identified nine planetary boundaries that define what they call a safe operating space for humanity. Crossing any one of those thresholds, they wrote, could have deleterious and even catastrophic consequences for human well being. They updated their report in 2015, and it showed that seven of the nine pl critical planetary boundaries are close to are already in the danger zone. Something has gone terribly wrong with the relationship between human society and the earth. Addressing the symptoms alone is dangerous. A fix for one problem may make other problems worse. Radical rem remedies are obviously required, but we won't find a cure unless we identify the underlying cause. The, system, the systemic disease that is attacking our life support systems. Many environmentalists identify the underlying problem simply as growth. And in fact, as many books and articles have shown, the drive to extract, produce, and grow ever more stuff is filling our rivers with poison and our air with pollution. Oceans are dying, species are disappearing at unprecedented rates, water is running short, and soil is eroding faster than it can be replaced. But the growth machine pushes on. Corporate executives, economists, bureaucrats, and politicians all agree that growth is good and non-growth is bad. Unending material expansion is a deliberate policy promoted by ideologues of every political stripe, from social democrats to conservatives. You know, when the G20 met in Toronto, near where I live a few years ago, they unanimously agreed that their highest priority was, quote, to lay the foundation for a strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. The final declaration they issued was only a handful of pages long, but the word growth appeared 29 times. <clears throat> Uncontrolled growth is clearly a central issue, but that only raises a further question. Why does the growth continue? Why is it in the face of massive evidence that expanded production and resource extraction is killing us, do governments and corporations keep shoveling coal for the runaway growth train? In most environmental writing, one of two explanations is offered. Either it's human nature or it's a mistake. The human nature argument is central to mainstream economics, which assumes that human beings are all, always want more. So economic growth is just capitalism's wonderful way of meeting human desires. For our species, enough is never enough. That often leads its proponents to conclude that the only way to slow or reverse the pillaging of Mother Earth is to slow or stop population growth. More people equals more stuff, so fewer people would equal less stuff. That claim, unfortunately, is fatally undermined by the fact that the countries with the highest birth rates have the lowest standard of living. The people in those countries own the least stuff and produce the least pollution. There was a study done at Yale University a few years ago that concluded that if the poorest 3 billion people on the planet somehow disappeared tomorrow, there would be virtually no reduction in ongoing environmental destruction. The other comp common explanation for the constant promotion of growth is that we have been seduced by a false ideology. The drive for growth has been described as a fetish, an obsession, an addiction, even a spell in one book I read. Such accounts prevent the drive for growth as a choice that politicians and investors make under the 
influence of a rather bizarre obsession. But as the British Marxist Fazi Ibrahim says, this must be the first time in history that a necessity has been described as a fetish. You might as well describe fish as having a fetish for water, as capitalism having a fetish for growth. Growth is as essential to capitalism as water is to fish. And as a fish would die without water, so capitalism would drown without growth. Growth ideology doesn't cause perpetual accumulation, it justifies it. Uncontrolled growth is not the root of the global crisis, it's the inevitable result of the profit system of capitalism's inherent drive to accumulate every ever more capital. As individuals, the people who run the giant polluting corporations undoubtedly want their children and grandchildren to live in a clean, environmentally sustainable world. But as major shareholders and executives and top managers, they act to use a wonderful phrase that Marx came up with, they act as personifications of capital. Regardless of how they behave at home or with their children, at work they are capital in human form. And the imperatives of capital take presence, precedence, excuse me, take precedence over all other needs and values. When it comes to a choice between protecting humanity's future and maximizing profit, they choose profit. And the reason they do that is very simple, although its implications are very complex and profound. Big banks and money funds and multimillionaires invest in order to make more money back. They really don't care if the company they invest in makes cars or clothes or candy bars so long as they get a return on their investment, as long as they get more out than they put in. Corporations, you see, are giant social machines for turning capital into more capital. That's what shareholders want and expect, and that's what managers and executives must deliver. A person who's unwilling to put the needs of capital first is unlikely to become a major corporate executive. And if the screening process fails, or if a CEO has an inconvenient attack of conscience, he or she will not last long in that position. It has been called the ecological tyranny of the bottom line. When protecting humanity and the planet might reduce profits, corporations always put profits first. Capital has only one measure of success. How much more profit was made in this quarter than in the previous quarter? How much more today than yesterday? It really doesn't matter if the sales include products that spread disease, destroy forests, demolish ecosystems, and treat our water, air, and soil as sewers. If it contributes to the growth of capital, that's what counts. Each corporation seeks to ensure that its products produce an attractive profit on invested capital. A corporation with lower costs or more attractive products can drive its competitors out of business. There's a constant pressure to expand physically, financially, and geographically in order to increase capital and thus to increase profit. If nothing stops it, Capital will try to expand forever and infinitely. But of course, the planet is not infinite. The atmosphere and the oceans and the forests are finite, limited resources. And capitalism is pressing against those limits. That is the defining feature of the capitalist system and the root cause of the global environmental crisis. Mass opposition and public pressure can slow down or hinder the drive for more, to expand more and faster, but it will always reassert itself in some form. It's like an autoimmune disease that attacks the body it dwells in. 
Capitalism is both part of the natural world and at war with it. It simultaneously depends upon and undermines our planet's life support systems. Capital's ecologically destructive impacts are driven not only by its need to grow, but by its need to grow faster. The circuit from investment to profit to reinvestment takes time to complete, and the longer it takes, the less total return the investors receive. Competition for investment produces constant pressure to speed up the cycle, to go from investment, investment to production to sale ever more quickly. That's why in 1925, it took 16 weeks to raise a two and a half pound chicken. Well, today, chickens twice that big are raised in six weeks. Selective breeding, hormones, and chemical feed have enabled factory farms to produce not just more meat, but more meat faster. The suffering of the animals and the quality of the food are secondary concerns, if they're considered at all. Fertile land is destroyed, forests are clear cut and fish populations collapse, all because of what the brilliant Marxist philosopher Istvan Mazarosh called the incurably short term horizon of the capital system. There's an insu insuperable conflict between nature's time and capital's time, between the cyclical processes that keep the earth going that have developed over hundreds of millions of years and capital's need for rapid production, sale, and profit. Since the middle of the 20th century, capitalism has caused unprecedented changes in the entire biosphere, in Earth's lands, forests, water, and air. In its everlasting and endless search for profits, capital is massively destroying and disrupting Earth's life support systems the natural processes and cycles that make life itself possible. What Marx be ca called metabolic rifts have become metabolic chasms in our time. That's why the environmental crisis can't, isn't, can't be just a talking point for socialists, not something we rate the odd article about and move on. It's a planetary emergency that we have to treat as a top priority. We have to initiate and join struggles for immediate environmental aims. We need to participate, not as sideline critics, but as activists, builders, and leaders. And at the same time, we need to find the best ways to patiently explain how those struggles relate to the higher, the larger fight to save the world from capitalist ecocide. In every country, we need governments that break with the existing order, that are answerable only to working people, farmers, the poor, indigenous communities, and immigrants. In a word, governments that answer to the victims of ecocidal capitalism, not to its beneficiaries and representatives. Such a profound transformation will not just happen. In fact, it will not happen at all unless ecology has a central place in socialist theory, in the socialist program, and in the activity of the socialist movement. In short, in the 21st century, socialists and greens must be eco-socialists and humanity needs an eco-socialist revolution. As James Connolly wrote, our demands most moderate are, we only want the earth. Thank you. Just heard from Ian, Ian Angus, the founder of Climate and Capitalism and author of works including Red Shade of Green, Intersections of Science and Socialism, and Facing the Anthropocene, Fossil Capitalism and the Crisis of the Earth System. The next speaker is Rahana Mohideen, feminist and socialist activist with the Party of the Labouring Masses, PLM, in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for uh, to Socialist Alliance and Green Left Weekly for inviting uh, the Party de la Pastang Massa, PLM, Philippines, a socialist party in the Philippines, 
uh, to uh, speak and um, attend uh, this um, important conference. I'm really pleased that uh, Socialist Alliance has organized uh, an eco-socialist conference. I think this is an important contribution to uh, certainly the movements and the left in the region. And uh, very pleased to know that you're going to be keeping this up uh, on an annual basis. So well done. And thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm very pleased to be on this panel uh, of uh, great speakers. Hello, Ian, nice to see you after so many years. And Sarah, uh, looking forward to your presentation. Um, I'm actually uh, about 100 kilometers outside Metro Manila. And of course, uh, welcome to third world conditions. We've got very uh, weak uh, internet infrastructure here. Um, so uh, I'll probably I'll put my video off and just go on to audio uh, at the moment, if uh, comrades don't mind. Uh, you might also hear a rooster <laughs> cry out. Uh, it cries out at different times during the day, but uh, hopefully try and ignore it. Okay, thank you. I'll just start my presentation on audio now. Um, uh, thank you, Ian, for uh, setting the, the broad uh, framework uh, of uh, the eco-socialist uh, project, if you like, or and uh, agenda as well. Um, and I'll really be looking at this from the perspective of uh, uh, the global south and uh, the movement in the Philippines. Uh, well, the countries of the global south in Asia uh, have been uh, acutely impacted by climate change. As you know, uh, in Southeast Asia, we've got some of the most vulnerable countries in the world. The Philippines is one of the most vulnerable. Vietnam uh, uh, is also extremely vulnerable, the coastline uh, to climate change impacts. Um, uh, the countries uh, uh, in Asia, uh, part of the global South, are also caught in the grip of debt. Uh, and reeling from the social, social and economic toll of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the multiple crises, what we call the multiple crises of the capitalist system. The conditions for peoples of the global south have only worsened further in the face of uh, vaccine inequality or vaccine apartheid, our collapsing public health systems that have been undermined and eroded uh, after the imposition of uh, decades of structural adjustment and neoliberal programs, uh, the unmet demands for debt cancellation and the continued financing and use of fossil fuels. Um, so our people sink more deeply into the multiple crises of capitalism. And these multiple crises must be accounted for in our clamor for climate justice. Now, um, climate justice, uh, is a key demand of the environment movement in the Philippines and the global south. It's fundamentally an anti-imperialist demand uh, because it calls and holds accountable the rich industrial countries of the global north, though, who are the highest contributors to ecological destruction and greenhouse gas emissions leading to global warming. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they all uh, um, the poorer countries of the global south, there's a historical accountability to the poorer countries of the global south and our communities affected by the climate crisis in the immediate and uh, long term. This is what we call a climate and ecological debt for which governments and uh, the corporations of the global north must be held accountable for. So it's fundamentally an anti-imperialist demand, but it's also aimed against the overall system. And I think this is uh, really important. And this is uh, a discussion that we've had and the movement has moved in the Philippines has moved in this direction. It also has to campaign, not just for climate change, but also for system uh, against, um, uh, for not only for climate justice, but also for system change. Uh, and this means uh, 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 looking at the role of uh, governments in the in the global south, uh, campaigning against uh, governments in the global south, such as the governments uh, in the Philippines, uh, both both current and previously, uh, based on national demands and uh, campaigns. 
Um, so uh, a climate justice, uh, uh, climate justice is a historical approach uh, based on uh, the understanding that emissions are cumulative. Um, and we also uh, say that uh, for rich countries to fully repay their climate debt and historical responsibility, the cuts will have to result in negative emissions way below zero. Since this is no longer physically possible, part of the payment of emissions debt is to make emissions reductions possible in developing countries by providing technology and finance. Now, uh, the, effects, uh, the effects of climate change uh, in the Philippines, uh, and you've probably seen this in uh, your evening news and uh, read about it as well, uh, is, uh, is disastrous. Um, it, it's not a question of arriving at a tipping point. We have passed certain tipping points. So we also talk about uh, uh, not only uh, mitigation, but adaptation. The need to both combine adaptation and mitigation is an absolute urgent reality uh, uh, in our communities. And part of this means disaster, uh, responding to disasters. And uh, the uh, people's movement, the mass movement, uh, uh, are essentially the, the first to respond to these disasters, uh, especially in their base areas in various communities. These are poor base areas, poor communities who have been the most vulnerable uh, to climate um, uh, change uh, uh, related disasters. Sea level rise in countries like the Philippines is a, is a major, is a major uh, uh, problem and uh, challenge. challenge. 50% uh, of the population in the Philippines will be affected by sea, sea level rise. Um, in um, a one meter rise in sea levels, we'll see the place that I'm living in at the moment, Cavite, and uh, the uh, capital Metro Manila uh, will be, uh, big portions of it will be underwater. And, and this um, uh, applies right across the country for major urban centers, such as Davao, Cebu, Legaspi, and so on in the other islands. And uh, uh, the, uh, one of the, the uh, main uh, 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 impacts is uh, our typhoons. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, we, we uh, around, sometimes up to 25 typhoons uh, um, go through uh, the Philippines uh, in primarily in the last six months and in the last, um, uh, some of the most devastating typhoons in the last quarter of the year. Uh, I think most of you are, are familiar with Typhoon Yolanda and Haiyan with 500 kilometers uh, wind uh, um, uh, coming through. Um, um, according to uh, official estimates, uh, uh, six million lives lost, but we know uh, from our organizers on the ground that it was much higher than this. And uh, in 2020, November last year, we had Typhoon Goni, uh, 280 uh, kilometers per hour winds. Uh, this is on the uh, very vulnerable northern and west coast of the Philippines. Uh, and I've got, uh, you know, about um, half a million uh, people affected, uh, hundreds of thousands of structures and homes lost, uh, and massive impacts. Every time these major type of super, what we call super typhoons go through, massive impacts on agriculture and people's livelihoods. Uh, really devastates uh, some of these communities and uh, uh, they, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, they, they don't really recover fully. It's just the impact one after the other. And this is the case with uh, the areas that were devastated by Typhoon Haiyan. Many of those fishing communities uh, have not fully recovered. Um, and uh, one of the main uh, issues that uh, uh, came up during Typhoon Goni in November last year was the lack of government support. Uh, people were on their roofs uh, waiting for days uh, before, before uh, there was any government support uh, to these uh, communities. And this uh, uh, 
uh, uh, triggered uh, a massive reaction by students in uh, universities uh, in uh, uh, around the Philippines with student walkouts uh, and students saying, we, we, we just want to uh, go to these communities and help them because the government is not doing anything. Uh, and the media covered it, covered all this really well with uh, incredibly uh, 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 shocking and uh, uh, sad uh, images of, of people just waiting, waiting for days uh, for uh, the, the government to respond. Uh, so there were massive student walkouts and uh, which uh, triggered a, a, a strike movement. Um, so as I said, mitigation and adaptation go hand in hand. And uh, um, during cyclones, um, uh, Yolanda or Hai Haiyan, um, uh, so some of our mass organizations were the first uh, people on the ground helping these communities, while the local elite had, uh, usually what the local elite do is they just leave on their helicopters and so on. So, uh, you know, that's also, and uh, the local elite are also the political elite, which is why you don't see uh, any real response by local governments as well. Uh, usually the response are from the local councils, what we call barangay or the barrio councils, which are the, the, uh, uh, the levels of local government closest to the community. Um, however, uh, so, uh, so uh, the, the uh, struggle for climate justice is also linked to uh, a range of national campaigns as well. Uh, and these, uh, some of the main campaigns that we have focused on uh, in the movement here is around uh, energy, uh, the closure of coal, the governments in the Philippines are still committed to coal, um, the closure of coal, uh, um, the uh, cost of uh, electricity. Uh, these are some of the main campaigns uh, that we focus on, building sustainable communities, food, la uh, land, and water, which is essentially looking at agriculture, sustainable agriculture, and food security. Um, and uh, in the energy uh, space, uh, we've, our main demand is an immediate moratorium on permits of new coal-fired power plants. Um, and we had a, a, a recent victory of sorts uh, just in the last couple of months where 13 coal projects of around uh, eight megawatt capacity, installed capacity, uh, were canceled, uh, primarily uh, because these were old systems, completely, uh, uh, you know, it was just not efficient to keep the systems running, but also because of public and community pressure in the communities that were affected by uh, the pollution of these old uh, coal um, uh, power systems. Uh, in terms of safe, sustainable, and resilient communities, one of our main campaigns is for community control uh, over uh, a, a range of um, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, projects, as well as um, uh, uh, disaster uh, uh, response and, um, uh, and management. Um, so, for example, the funds that come in uh, are under community control. So uh, community control is one of the major demands that we put forward. And of course, in terms of agriculture, food security, and this is against uh, uh, the uh, private uh, corporations, use of land, uh, the privatization of land. And it's also very much tied up with the question of um, uh, uh, land uh, redistribution uh, to uh, poor farmers um, as well, uh, land reform, what we call land reform uh, uh, in the agricultural and in the rural uh, sector areas. Um, uh, another important aspect of the climate justice uh, program and campaign is uh, the, the debt, uh, debt cancellation. Uh, public funds are urgently needed for health and social protection, and these are being siphoned into servicing debts, much of which are illegitimate debts that have caused continuing harm to people and the environment. Debt servicing is the tightening noose that governments, international financial institutions, and lenders tie around the neck of the peoples of the global south. 
The Philippines' external debt this year, at the end of this year, will be around 7.5 billion US. Uh, since the start of 2021, the external debt has increased by 8.2% just in the last few months, as the government has borrowed uh, from foreign sources and issued dollar-denominated bonds for the pandemic. These are essentially pandemic funds. And um, uh, and uh, the the problem with these pandemic funds is uh, they're not e and they're not even being used for the pandemic. Uh, there's massive corruption, what we call plunder in the Philippines, of these uh, funds that have been supposedly given uh, for pandemic response. The Department of Health, uh, the much of this has been uh, allocated to. The Department of Health, and there are and funds have gone missing, and this is a a, a huge uh, issue at the moment uh, that uh, the Senate has taken up. Uh, funds have uh, gone missing, and and, about, and tens of millions of dollars of these pandemic funds uh, externally borrowed. These are not grants; these are all loans, uh, high interest loans, have gone missing from the Department of Health. And there's a major investigation going on at the moment. And um, uh, apart from debt cancellation, uh, another main campaign, uh, a historic campaign that has been going on for decades in the Philippines is against the automatic appropriation law, which was put in place uh, as a law under Korea Pino, after, uh, who was the president after the collapse of the Marcos dictatorship, and that is that uh, a part of the national budget is automatically set aside for external debt repayment, and that's mainly the interest on debt. So the, these are key climate justice demands as well. And when we talk about climate justice, when we campaign for climate justice, uh, these demands are um, there up front. Uh, the other uh, aspect of uh, uh, the climate justice um, uh, campaigns and uh, uh, a major uh, issue for us is the killing of climate justice activists. In the Philippines, we, uh, we've got some of the uh, uh, highest number of um, murders, killings of climate justice activists. Uh, a lot of these uh, are by uh, the local elite. Uh, you've got the national oligarchy who basically run the government and the political system nationally, and you've got the local elite who are into logging, uh, dirty uh, mining, uh, and uh, uh, quarrying, and a whole range of things like that. And uh, 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 these are uh, essentially, uh, 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 and they're all, they've also got their own armed. Uh, goons and gangs, and so these are carried out by, by uh, the local elite. But it's also, but and none of them have been uh, uh, arrested. Um, so this is all a part of the culture of impunity uh, that you have here. Uh, and one of the, and I need to mention that uh, one of our main campaigns at the moment is one of our women leaders who was uh, killed, uh, Gloria Capitan. Um, and she was killed uh, last July um, and uh, by uh, two men uh, um, uh, on uh, uh, gunmen uh, riding on a motorbike. She was a 57 year old uh, mother and a grandmother, and she was active in the fight against coal uh, in her community and led a series of mass actions calling for the permanent closure of uh, a coal stockpile in her village. Now, um, uh, we also point out that uh, uh, what are the, the false solutions, especially uh, those followed by rich countries uh, you know, globally uh, and rich countries and their corporations to avoid accountability. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, in this, um, uh, this uh, 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 <laughs> clean coal or, or clean fossil fuels, uh, which is... Um, has creeped in through the net uh, zero emissions uh, uh, agenda, uh, uh, and, uh, which is essentially a technological fix uh, based on uh, the idea that uh, carbon capture uh, technology uh, can uh, clean up uh, coal and clean up the environment. Uh, unjust transitions, what we call unjust transitions where uh, the South is left behind, 
or uh, poorer communities uh, in uh, countries of the global south uh, are left behind. Individual efforts without collective action. Uh, we, call, we call these false solutions as well. And of course, uh, market-based uh, solutions. Um, now, and uh, uh, our demands are framed around uh, some of the some of the key pillars would be that polluters must pay climate funding for the gl global south from the global north uh, and system change, not climate change, and uh, what we call a just transition. Um, and I'll go into this question of a just transition a bit later on. Uh, well, actually, right now. Um, well, the, the just transition is. Uh, uh, understood in the uh, environment movement here that um, uh, uh, we we need um, uh, we do need industrial development, but uh, uh, to, but a low carbon um, or zero carbon uh, industrial development uh, because uh, people's livelihoods, uh, uh, people's welfare, and people's rights. Um, uh, cannot be ignored uh, during the transition. And of course, the just transition also uh, uh, takes in, has to take into account the historical responsibilities and obligations of the global north uh, and uh, their corporations. Uh, but um, uh, we are also um, uh, rethinking this idea of the just transition. And uh, um, we are saying that the just transition needs to be a part of the transition towards socialism. Uh, so while we uh, uh, address the immediate demands of affected communities, alternative jobs and likely livelihoods for workers and, uh, and communities uh, in the transition to clean and renewable energy, um, we also have to look at the longer term strategic and programmatic view of system change and towards a transition to socialism. Um, now, um, <clears throat> uh, key elements of what could be described as an eco-socialist program, I guess, are embedded in various uh, documents and positions uh, that the left uh, and the uh, 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 environment movement, um, uh, where of uh, which is led by the left, uh, put forward. Uh, now in PLM, uh, we have a platform, platform Anang Masa, that is the platform for the masses, and Bainihang Socialismo, which is um, what we call solidarity socialism, drawing from the concept of uh, historical concept of Bainihang which is essentially communal, uh, communal economies, communal societies uh, that uh, existed prior to uh, colonization. Uh, and um, a central pillar of all this is the preservation of the environment uh, um, as well as uh, community control. Um, so we put forward this idea of uh, community control, communal production and so on. Uh, which uh, Marx talks about uh, and uh, in his Grundis, and we, we've looked at the Grundis, and we, we look at this idea of community control, uh, communal production in relation to the Bainihan. Now we have, um, I should, uh, I've been told I've got to finish up my last couple of slides, if you could just spare me uh, a couple more minutes. Um, uh, we are uh, putting forward um, we, uh, we've got elections coming up uh, in um, uh, May 2022 20, next year, and we're putting forward a socialist green progressive alliance. Um, and this progress, uh, socialist green progressive alliance will be putting forward some of the key elements of an eco-socialist platform. The green part of the socialist part is our, us. <laughs> the green part of the, and Labanang Masa, Labanang Masa is a left uh, coalition headed by Walden Bellio, uh, who is the chairperson. Uh, Walden Bellio is running for vice president of PLM in the elections next year. And uh, one of our worker leaders will be running for president, Yodidi Guzman. 
The Green Party of this alliance is the Nature Party of the Philippines, the Green Party of the Philippines, as well as who will be running as PLM candidates for the Senate, um, as well as uh, the Green Bangsamoro uh, Regional uh, Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, which is the struggle for national self-determination of the Bangsamoro people in the South, and uh, um, one of the major ethnic groupings in the South, the Lumad Mindanao People's Federation. This is our green coalition. We're discussing their platform. We're discussing our platform, and we're putting together some of the main elements of an eco-socialist platform, if you like, uh, for the coming elections. So to conclude, uh, I have outlined the elements of a developing eco-socialist movement in the Philippines, draw and that program as we go into these elections, drawing from the international movement, our own historical and revolutionary traditions and our current conditions. Thank you very much. So Rahana Mohadeen is a feminist and socialist activist with the party of laboring masses, PLM in the Philippines. And um, I'd also like to make an announcement about the Socialism 2021 conference, which is on November the 27th to the 28th and December the 4th to the 5th, organized by a coalition of Southeast Asian socialist parties, including SA, PLM, and the Malaysian Socialist Party. If you want to know more, uh, go to socialismconf, that's socialismconf.org slash hashtag program P-R-O-G-R-A-M. Our final speaker for this session is Sarah Hathaway. So Sarah is a national co-convener of Socialist Alliance, a union organiser and climate activist. So I just want to begin too by acknowledging that I'm joining you on Wadawurrung country in uh, southeast Australia, um, pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so I've broken my talk up into three sections to speak to three questions. Firstly, as per the title, why eco-socialism? What do we mean by eco-socialism? And finally, how are we going to get there? So firstly, in response to why eco-socialism, um, capitalism creates crisis after crisis that it is unable to address itself, whether that is the overall increasing reality of the global climate crisis in Australia, we've recently seen that expressed in some of the worst bushfires we, we have ever seen um, at the end of 2019 and early 2020, or the global pandemic of COVID-19 that we know was also a result of environmental destruction and climate change that has been going on for over 18 months now, or the increasing rates of unemployment and homelessness that have been accelerated by the pandemic but were already a problem prior to the pandemic. Capitalism largely creates all of these crises due to its extractivist nature. Extraction of fossil fuels, minerals, other natural resources, profits, labour, all at the cost of the environment, the planet, quality of life and humanity generally. Further, each crisis thrown up by capitalism disproportionately impacts those already marginalised by society be that First Nations communities, people living in global South countries, or women, all bear the worst of these crises thrown up by a defective system. And to counter these crises, um, we need to do the opposite of capitalism. We need to put people and the planet ahead of profits. However, this goes against the very nature of the capitalist system and no amount of reforming or tinkering around the edges of this system is going to change that underlying nature. And therefore we do need a system that is radically different. Because capitalism is incapable of addressing the crises it creates, it regularly relies on the state to bail it out. Um, and I liken this behavior exhibited um, by my three-year-old daughter um, who, like most small children, needs to play with all her toys at once in the lounge room. And regularly she turns the whole room into a giant mess, an obstacle of pointy Lego pieces that you need to dodge to get through the room. And then she'll have a moment of realisation. She'll turn around and say, Mummy, the lounge room is very messy. 
And I'll point out that it's her mess and maybe she should put some of her toys away. So she sits there and sulks for a bit before I offer to help clean up. And while she initially seems to jump in with some enthusiasm to help, I'm two thirds of the way through cleaning everything up before I realize she's been playing with the first toy she picked up for the last 20 minutes and hasn't actually helped clean anything up. However, to step out of that analogy, the state after decades of neoliberalism is increasingly less capable of responding to the crises that capitalism throws up. And again, just using Australia as the example, despite being a wealthy advantaged nation, neoliberalism has really done a number on the public service and public resources available. For instance, during the 2019-2020 bushfires, there were stories of volunteer firefighters facing the worst of those fires without any PPE or without proper PPE, or asking for various bits of PPE as a birthday present. There seemed to be a complete inability by the state to respond to the people and towns that were impacted by the fires, either in the midst of the crisis or immediately preceding with a heavy reliance on the NGO sector to respond instead. Ironically, the one thing that many people commented on as keeping them alive was Australia's public broadcast radio station, um, ABC Radio National, that the federal government has been working to defund. We heard stories of supermarkets and petrol stations hiring private security to guard their venues um, and they were checking people's driver's licenses for their home postcodes and refusing to serve anyone who didn't live in the immediate area. Never mind, it was in the midst of tourism season and that the fires were causing people to move around um, a large area of a couple of states. Or more recently has been the failure of state and federal governments to respond to the crisis of COVID-19. And whilst there was an initial response of financial aid last year with free childcare, the doubling of JobSeeker and the introduction of JobKeeper, even this came with flaws. One of the reasons why JobKeeper was paid to employers rather than individual workers was due to the decimation of the public service. The Department of Human Services or Centrelink has been so severely reduced that the federal government's only option was to utilise the Australian tax office, which meant paying the employers to subsidise wages. The purpose of the subsidy was to stop employers laying off workers during the pandemic last year. However, the subsidy was meant to be based on an employer's loss of income. Instead, we saw mass rorting of this occurring and the Australian federal government has subsequently admitted that they were aware that there were employers who received this payment who weren't financially impacted by COVID. In fact, there were some who even managed to increase their profit margin during the pandemic. A public example was made of Jerry Harvey, the CEO of an electronics company called Harvey Norman. After the company received JobKeeper, whilst also having a year of record sales with a 15.3% increase in total revenue to $9.72 billion and a 75.1% increase in profit after tax of 841.41 million. After a public campaign where the union movement sought to make an example of Jerry Harvey, the company repaid $6 million back to the federal government out of the $22 million it had received in subsidies from the taxpayer. An assessment from the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office last month found that $12.5 billion was paid to businesses that didn't see a shortfall in revenue from April to June last year. In summary, whilst the Australian government can provide billions to subsidise employers already making record profits, it lacks the resources and logistical ability on the ground to oversee these measures to prevent rorting or to deliver other services needed during a crisis. This has led to an over-reliance of the NGO sector, um, as well as a recent increased use of ADF troops for logistical support on the ground. 
Finally, not only is capitalism incapable of addressing the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced, which is the threat to continued sustainability of life on this planet, capitalism is actively undermining moves to address the crisis. Earlier this year, a Greenpeace investigation tricked a top ExxonMobil lobbyist into revealing company efforts to promote climate change denial. ExxonMobil's Senior Director for Federal Relations talked about working with shadow groups, supporting a carbon tax that had no chance of getting through Congress just for the sake of climate change PR, all the while influencing senators to weaken climate elements of Biden's infrastructure bill. The oil giants have been using them to spread disinformation and downplay the dangers of global warming for decades. ExxonMobil alone spent more than $30 million doing that between 1998 and 2014. In this context, we need to be unequivocal that zero emissions by 2050 is not a target. It is surrender to catastrophic climate change. The science is clear on this. And in Australia, both the Liberal National Party in government and the Australian Labor Party in opposition are failing. Both are beholden to the fossil fuel and mining companies in Australia. 2050 is a meaningless target for a country with one of the highest per capita emission rates compared with um, other OECD countries because it delays the necessary transition, making it harder for workers and communities who will bear the brunt of the changes. Secondly, it comes with lots of caveats, which the nationals are now busy extracting bit by bit. The nationals demand that rural areas be exempt from the net zero goal has not fallen on deaf ears. Billions of dollars are likely to still come their way in the form of fossil fuel public subsidies. The Australia Institute estimates that Australia's fossil fuel subsidies amounted to a staggering $10.3 billion just over the 2020-2021 period. This breaks down to over $19.5 yeah, 19 being handed over every minute of every day to coal, oil and gas companies and other major users of fossil fuels. Off the back of the AUKUS nuclear submarines deal that the Australian government has recently made with the US and UK, both Biden and Johnson have been putting significant pressure on Scott Morrison to agree to the 2050 target at the upcoming COP26. Further, the Australian federal government appears to be reframing the issue of climate change in terms of a national security issue. Further, it seems even the Murdoch press have called a ceasefire where it comes to their anti-climate change rhetoric in the lead up to COP26. The Murdoch press have shifted gears from climate denialism to delaying climate action with non-solutions and unaccountable long-term targets. In a similar vein, independent MP Zali Stegall's National Framework for Adaptation and Mitigation Bill should also be opposed by all climate activists. Zali Stegall's bill also aims for zero emissions by 2050 with a 60% reduction by 2030. And these measures are next to useless. Further, they're dangerous as particularly with Zali Stegall's bill, they are sucking in layers of climate activists to campaign for it. Finally, eco-socialism is the best alternative to the Trump style reactionary anti-science, anti-truth popularism that hasn't gone away in the US and appears to be on the increase in Australia. Recently expressed by anti-lockdown and anti-vaccination protests, which led to the smashing up of the construction union office in Melbourne. A greater danger is that these politics have infiltrated unions with unions providing little in the way of political education or campaigns to counter it. We are still faced with a jobs at any cost approach in a number of blue collar unions as a counter to campaigns calling for jobs in the renewable sector. So what do we mean by eco-socialism? In 2020, Green Left published an eco-socialist manifesto for further development and discussion, which stated the following. 
The corporate rich that now rule the world stole much of their starting capital directly or indirectly through colonial plunder. They destroyed numerous societies around the globe, many of whom were organised for thousands of years around Indigenous social values of egalitarianism, cooperation and coexistence with nature. An eco-socialist future would require a return to such principles with the benefit of technological advances used for social good. Under capitalism, almost every technological advance is used to deepen the exploitation of the majority and nature and to build dangerous weapons of mass destruction and suppression. An eco-socialist society would liberate human creativity through translating productivity gains into a radically shorter working week. This is also necessary to free the majority of the population, now exploited to the point of exhaustion or discarded as surplus labour, to exercise direct democratic control of society. An eco-socialist society will need to be based on grassroots direct democracy that allows communities to have real control over their destinies. A new mass movement for eco-socialist revolution needs to be built from the radicalising climate emergency movement and other progressive mass movements such as the Black Lives Matter movement that are challenging the capitalist system in the face of rising fascist movements, racism, sexism and attacks on civil liberties. In all of these movements, we hear calls to end capitalism and build a new future based on the collective and ecologically sustainable traditions that capitalism has tried its best to wipe out for over the last 400 years. Eco-socialists seek to unite and amplify those voices for real change. History teaches us that people's political consciousness can develop rapidly in the process of sustained collective struggle and that such movements act as schools of direct democracy. They can also give birth to new institutions of popular democracy. Therefore, it is of critical importance to build mass movements around programs of immediate and transitional me measures that the climate emergency demands. So how are we gonna get there? Such mass movements need to be based on real grassroots democracy. That is proper democratic structures where all involved in the campaign can have a say and a vote and are predicated upon a genuine united front approach that seeks to bring in various groups, including students, unions, community organisations, faith-based organisations, etc. Whilst we have seen some good platforms being put forward in recent years by Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders that have mobilised and inspired large numbers of people, including young people, all the elected positions in the world won't get us there. Just as we cannot consume our way out of this crisis, nor can we vote our way out of it. We need to take working class people seriously and have trust in them to participate in and lead campaigns, rather than either the ultra left or liberal approach that seeks to patronize working people or keep them out of decision making. Um, I'm part of a community campaign in Geelong to oppose a multinational company building a offshore gas import terminal um, in the middle of our bay and the city that I live in wraps around this bay. So the whole city um, of over sort of 350,000 people are going to be impacted um, by this gas import terminal if it goes ahead and the shipping channels that come into the bay. But the people right on the forefront of this gas terminal, these are people whose kitchens and lounge rooms are within about 250 metres of the shipping channel where these LNG tankers are coming in, um, are in the northern suburbs and traditionally it's been a low socioeconomic area. Um, and there was recently an article um, published by the ABC that illustrated the levels of poverty in the northern suburbs. So people... Um, living hand to mouth, um, you know, not even being able to put food on the table and reliance on some of the community programs that have been set up. Um, and the response to that from some of the climate activists that we're working with on this gas terminal was, well, we can't possibly go and door knock these people to talk about a gas terminal or the environment because 
they're so ground down by the realities of their own life and whether they're going to eat this week they're not like they're not going to care about a gas terminal or the climate um and we know from our experience door knocking this area in local council elections that as as difficult as people's living circumstances are it is actually possible for human beings to worry about how they're going to pay the bills or put food on the table and also simultaneously be worried about the climate or a gas terminal or you know whatever other social justice issues that we're campaigning on and I think you know it's incumbent on us as socialists to really make sure that the most marginalized in our communities aren't just being dismissed um, because they will you know they will fall in with um, popularist right-wing solutions instead um, further, such mass movements that are led by United Fronts should have an internationalist approach um, to connect and learn from other struggles, but also to counter the racism and imperialism that is continuously pushed on, on us um, to divide working people. The deepening crisis that we are confronted with today makes it clear that time is of the essence. The time to stop capitalism from destroying our common future is running out. The need to build this mass movement for change means we urgently need to build eco-socialist organisations and global networks that can, can unite their impact. Thanks, comments.